Hi everyone and welcome to the next module in the Global Emergency Medicine curriculum. My name is Christy Hadley. I am an emergency physician practicing at Columbia University in New York City and I additionally work as a program director at the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education based at the School of Public Health at Columbia as well. I did residency at the University of North Carolina and a fellowship in Global Emergency Medicine at Columbia. At, while I was there I concentrated in climate and health. And so I'm really excited here to be here today to talk about such an important topic. So this lecture is on the social determinants of health, which is a phrase that I'm sure many of you have heard before, either in medical school or in residency or even before that. And I'm sure for many of you, it's also a phrase that makes intuitive sense. Of course, people's health is impacted by their social environment. That becomes very clear from almost week one of residency. Maybe it was when you tried to prescribe a medication and the pharmacist called you back and said the insurance wouldn't cover it or that the patient didn't have insurance and it was too expensive or maybe it's one that you had a middle-aged woman come in and she was having chest pain and trouble breathing but after you talked to her for a while you realized that the real issue was that she was taking care of her entire family the bills were due her brother had just died and she wasn't really sure how she was going to pay for her food for her grandkids or her kids that month so while we all know that these social factors impact our patient's health that are outside of their control and they're really a lot of the reasons why they're in the emergency department. How much do those factors actually matter? And what do we do about it as emergency doctors? So I have no disclosures. So let's talk first about our objectives. So the objectives for this lecture are to define and identify social determinants of health, to describe how social determinants of health impact health outcomes, and to identify examples of strategies that can be used in medicine globally to improve systems and policies that affect social determinants of health. So we're gonna to get to all of those things, but first I wanna take it back to the emergency department to really ground our discussion in why talking about the social departments of determinants of health are just so important. So you're sitting in the doc box and a new patient pops up on the board. It's a nine year old woman with abdominal pain. Vitals look okay. You're in a decent spot with your other patients, so you decide to get up and see them. Or maybe you're getting crushed, but you know you don't really want to let a nine-year-old with abdominal pain sit on your board unseen. So you pick them up. You make note of the room number and you head to go see them. As you open the curtain, this is what you find. You murmur some apologies, you back away quickly, and you head back to your desk because clearly you must have gotten the room number wrong. You take a look at the board again, you see the room number was correct, and this time you look at her name as well. You head back, you open the curtain again, and you kind of murmur, Miss Jones? Hesitantly, and she answers, yes, that that's her. I can't really tell you how many times that this has happened in the years, over the years to me, that your patient looks way too young and healthy to be the age that they say they are. That is in contrast to another unfortunately familiar patient. So you get a notification from EMS that they're bringing in a patient on CPAP. He's initially formed in severe respiratory distress. He's now doing a little bit better now that he's on CPAP. And as the patient rolls by, you get a good look at who's sitting on the bed and you see this, a young man in his 30s. You find out later that he has severe heart failure, presumably from untreated hypertension. So neither of these patients is likely unfamiliar to any of us who work in the emergency department. Um, but they illustrated some really important concepts, I think. And so why do I start with these patients? For me, they bring up a really fundamental question or two fundamental questions. And that is what makes a person healthy and what determines health? Now, this is probably pretty simple. Um, it's pretty, they're very simple questions, right? But it turns out they have incredibly complicated answers. And that's really what brings us here today and what makes the practice of medicine so difficult. And so if we can figure out why this 9 year old has no medical problems and looks like she's 50 and this 30 year old who realistically may not live to see 40, we understand why he's so sick, then we might have a better chance of taking care of our patients. So for me, in the first week of residency, when I saw these particular patients, it was pretty simple to, you know, marvel at the 9 year old to ask her what her secrets were for a long and healthy life. and. It was equally simple to remark with regret what crappy genetics this unfortunate 30-year-old must have had to have hypertension so bad that his heart started to fail in just his third decade of life. However, by second and third year, and you know, as time goes on, after seeing so many patients that resemble these two, genetics and personal choice don't really seem to make sense to explain the differences in the life trajectories of these two patients. 
So what is going on if we can't blame those? So while I was doing some research for this module, I came across a really interesting TED talk by Dr. Abdullah Sayed. The talk is about why some people suffer poor health and why other people don't and what we can do about it. The whole talk is very interesting, uh, but I'm just gonna play part of it here that is relevant to our discussion. For context, at the time of this talk, Dr. Al Sayed was part of the health director of Detroit. He starts the talk talking about assumptions that people make about health. And those two assumptions are that health, both good and bad, are primarily driven by lifestyle and genetics. He goes on then to refute those assumptions and presents the evidence for a different argument, which is where we'll pick it up. So I want to talk about something that affects all of us. Some of us might wake up in the morning and we have some pain, maybe a pain in the knee or a back pain that just won't go away. Some of us might suffer something far more serious, like heart disease or cancer or have had a stroke or two. And if you suffer them now, then you know how important poor health can be for you. And if you don't, remember that at some point you probably will. I want to talk about the differential experience of health. Why is it that some people suffer and other people don't? And what is it that we can do about that? After all, 69% of us just this year said, we want to be a little bit more healthy, want to lose some weight. Health is something that's on the tip of all of our tongues, on the edge of all of our minds. So we might have Googled something, and you see here, uh, healthy steps to, to healthy living, or uh, eight ways that you can optimize your health. Or we might have gotten one of these, a fitness tracker that I wear, that helps us to keep track of how much physical activity we have, we've done, how much we walk or how much we run. And that's because we assume that health is about lifestyle, that we have a choice about the kind of health that we might experience. Or perhaps somebody might have gotten you a gift that uh, allows you to take a cheek swab and see what your genes tell you about your past and maybe your future. After all, there are tons of studies that have linked all kinds of genes to all kinds of outcomes. Here you see studies find more genetic links to obesity. So we also assume that health is about our genes. Health is either about what we choose to do in our lifestyles or health is embedded way before we ever had any choice in the matter. But I want us to look at the evidence. What does the evidence actually tell us? What does science tell us about the experience of good health? What you see here is a map of premature death per 100,000 people all over the country. And what you should see is that it's not a ubiquitous experience. There are certain places where health is worse than other places. And that takes us to the first fact, which is that place matters more than either lifestyle or genetics. And we can dig deeper. We can ask ourselves about the variation in the experience of health and wellness among those who are poor. What I'm gonna show you is data by Raj Chetty and colleagues, an economist at Stanford, who wanted to ask, where is it that the poor live longer versus shorter lives? What you see here is a map, and you can immediately look at our corner of the world, the edge of the thumb, and you see that that's red. Generally, when you see red on a map, bad thing. What you're seeing here is a graph of life expectancy by income percentile. And you'll note among both men and women that generally income is associated with better health. But what you're seeing here is a contrast between New York City and Detroit. And you see that after the 50th percentile, you have this unraveling of the two curves. How do we explain that? But first, the second fact is that place matters even more for the poor. I want to get a little bit personal because I lived in New York just two years ago. And when I moved to, uh, to Detroit, my life expectancy didn't really go anywhere. And that's because I'm insulated by the fact that I have money and resources and education and human capital. So if I choose not to eat well, it's not because I was a prisoner to my context. It's not because I didn't have that on offer. It's because I didn't leverage everything I had to go off to the grocery store and get a healthy meal or go out to the gym and exercise. I want to contrast that with Ms. Joy. She's a 66-year-old woman who I take care of in, in Detroit. She's somebody who is part of the 677,000 people who I'm responsible for as the health director in the city. And if I were to say, Ms. Joy, you know, you really ought to eat better. You know what she'd tell me? Now, that's lovely, except for the nearest grocery store is about three miles away from my house, and I don't have a car. So I can't really get there. And, well, if you want me to exercise, that's really great, too, except for, you know what time the sun goes down? It's about six. I get home from my second job around six. And I'd love to go outside, and I'd love to take a walk, but unfortunately, my neighborhood gets a little scary after dark. 
So I hear you about healthy lifestyles. That's just not going to work for me. This kind of challenge is not uncommon in Detroit. We know that Detroit's a relatively poor city with a poverty rate around 40%. But it's not just about poverty. It's about the alchemy of poverty and racism over a very particular geography. Because remember, place matters more, and it matters even more for the poor. Detroit is a huge city. You could fit all of Boston, San Francisco, and Manhattan on our city and still have room to spare. So you have poor people in a big city that's highly vacant. What you're seeing here is the efflux from Detroit. Not since 1967, when it started, but in the last completed decade, between 2000 and 2010. And it's really hard to get around. The tragic irony of the Motor City is that only about 40% of Detroiters have regular access to a car. 20% have no car at all, and 40%, they might have a car, but it's shared with so many people, or it's so broken down that they can't really rely on it in the way that you or I might be able to. And lastly, we cannot ignore the fact of race. What you're seeing here is a map of redlining. This is a map from the late 1930s by a group called the Hearn Brothers, who were real estate moguls in Detroit. And what it shows you is where people of particular races could live and not live. And so what has happened over 60 years is we have concentrated poor, the poor and minorities in particular parts of our city, even as we built highways for certain people to be able to leave. We did not build public transportation, we built highways. Because who built Detroit? The automotive industry. Which gets us to the third fact, that health is about access. Right? The reason place matters is because health is about access to food and exercise and education and healthcare and social support and about exposure to things like trauma and violence and racism. But there are opportunities. Public health is what we as a society do collectively to assure the conditions within which people can be healthy. To assure the conditions within which people can be healthy. Public health is about place. And the first opportunity that we have is to be able to think about access to food and exercise and education and healthcare and social support and exposure to trauma and violence and racism and invest in public health. The second is to think about what causes disease in the first place. Heart disease is the most common killer in American society and the globe overall. So I want us to think about what causes this gentleman's heart attacks. Now, I know this gentleman looks a lot like President Barack Obama. I mean the, the former president no harm. So, uh, so let's ask about what, what, what causes heart attacks in President Barack Obama, and that's this. Uh, <laughs> But let, let's get down to it. So what, what causes heart attacks? If this was a room full of medical students, you guys would tell me something like this. Atherosclerotic plaques, right? It's when you have infestation of the intima by cholesterol over time that causes a blockage of a coronary artery which blocks downstream blood from parts of the heart which kills the heart which causes a heart attack. That's a, that's a right answer. But we have to think upstream. What are the causes of the causes? Things like hypertension and high cholesterol and obesity. But let's keep asking, what causes a heart attack? Things like smoking, and poor diets, and low physical activity, and smog. You guys know the drill already, right? What causes that? Social policy, poverty, and economics. Our second opportunity is that we have to think upstream. It's not enough for us to be focused just on pathophysiology. In the physical realm, we have to be thinking about pathophysiology in the social realm. And let's think about the consequences of a heart attack. This gentleman here, he has a heart attack, our protagonist. He, he suffers from a heart attack, and he just moved into a really nice home in a nice neighborhood. What happens? Well, unfortunately, the average heart attack costs you about $760,000. That's with the ACA. And so what happens? He can't actually pay, right? He had to make... Whatever it was, payment that, he, that, that, that missed what his insurance could have paid for him, and this gentleman, unfortunately, loses his home. So he's forced to move somewhere else. So we see how poor health shapes poverty. And so we look in his new home, and then we ask, well, what are the kinds of things that his child could be exposed to in a home like this? Dirty water, paint chips, which cause lead poisoning, which then drives how poverty shapes poor health. Keep going. That child who's exposed to the lead in the home, 
but now suffers in school because that kid never had the shot that you or I might have had to get to school with a healthy mind. It was poison before he ever started. We reify the relationship between poor health and poverty. Keep going. That child now lives in the same neighborhood that's going to expose his children to the same things. And we reify the relationship between poverty and poor health. Public health is about addressing this challenge. And that opportunity is to tackle feedback cycles, to be asking ourselves, where is it that we can intervene, where we can address these vicious feedback loops that trap people in both poverty and poor health? And that takes me to our work at the Detroit Health Department. What we do is we leverage health to disrupt intergenerational poverty. Our goal is to be thinking about the barriers that children face to being able to learn and earn like any child anywhere in America. And our job is to systematically dismantle them so that those kids have the same shot at the life trajectory we all want for our kids. I want to talk about four outcomes that we're talking about, that we're working very, very heavily on, share with you a couple of the projects that we're building. Poor infant health. Did you know that a baby who's preterm is likely to earn about $3,000 less at 30 than a child who wasn't preterm? Unintended teen pregnancy. A woman who chooses not to get pregnant, but becomes pregnant anyway before she graduates high school, her likelihood of dropping out of high school is 50%. And the likelihood of her child being preterm goes up twice. Asthma, it's the single leading health cause of school days missed. Poor vision, if you can't see the board, you can't learn the board. And so we're tackling these problems because they are core to that feedback loop between poverty and poor health. Let's talk about poor infant health first. We're building a program where we are teaching women across our city to be able to mentor women throughout their pregnancy. It's called Sister Friends. And the goal of this is both to provide a mentor for a woman who becomes pregnant, walk her through negative nine months to one year, and at the same time, be able to connect her to the number of resources that are there. Unfortunately, infant mortality is far more common among the most vulnerable. And so if we can't reach out via the best resources that we have, which are Detroiters, um, then we can't address the challenge. Unintended teen pregnancy. We know that long-acting reversible contraceptives are the leading way to prevent unintended teen pregnancy. These are modalities of contraception that don't require a point of use. You don't have to take a pill every night. You don't have to use a condom when you have sex. But unfortunately, only about 2.5% of young women in Detroit use these, even though they're first line. So we're trying to take a multimodal approach to this. First, we want to make sure that doctors in Detroit know how to use long-acting reversible contraceptives. Second, we want to make sure that people know about this. Oftentimes, people don't know that you can get an implant or an IUD, and it's good for three to five years, and you don't have to worry about getting pregnant thereafter. And then we want to be able to provide access to these services in places that are discreet and not stigmatizing. And so we're thinking about being able to put these in places that you wouldn't otherwise think about going to get preconception services, like a rec center, where you could be just as well going to play basketball. Asthma. Our asthma hospitalization rate is three times as high as the rest of the state of Michigan. Like I said, that yields children not in school, not learning. And this is largely because of the number of high emitters across the city of Detroit. We are a relatively industrial city. And so there are a number of polluters who live in and around our city, which creates the context for asthma. And what we're doing is we are equipping children with inhalers that are equipped with sensors. And every time a child uses that inhaler, it sends information out to a cloud. And what that allows us to do is to generate an asthma heat map, to be able to give families and doctors taking care of children with asthma real-time information about their risk of an exacerbation. And then lastly, poor vision. I want to share with you a couple statistics. 35,000 children in Detroit are going to test positive for a vision deficit. 35,000 a year, positive for a vision deficit. And about 30% of them, on average, over the past several years, would come back the next year screened again, meaning that we weren't able, as a system, to give them a pair of glasses. So we've launched a program where we're teaming up with a nonprofit to be able to do a full optometric exam at school, provide children a pair of glasses, Every kid in Detroit who needs a pair of glasses will get one two weeks delivered at school. And what you're seeing here is a picture from the launch. After all, 69% of us this year made a goal about our health. We decided that we wanted to be a little bit healthier. We wanted to lose weight, stay fit and healthy. But unfortunately, not all of us have access to that. When I drove here, the 45 minutes that I drove here, I drove nine years of life expectancy. And when we ask ourselves how that can happen, 
in the richest country in the world, we have to be focusing on opportunities to invest in public health, to tackle feedback cycles, and to think upstream. Thank you. So in his TED talk, Dr. Abdul Saeed, he talks about three different facts. And these facts I wanna dive into a little bit deeper. And so the first two facts are really about place. And so place matters more than lifestyle or genetics and place matters even more for the poor. So this graph shows life expectancy from 1772 to 2019 for different regions of the world. And you can see that in the beginning, it was pretty level, it stayed steady for quite a while. And then there's this exponential growth. And there's this exponential growth in all parts of the world. However, even though there's exponential growth everywhere, there's still pretty significant differences between different regions. And this isn't anything that's new to anyone who's gonna be watching this video. Um, but it's worth noting that the life expectancies are still very, very different. And you can see it again in this map showing the same thing, but just in a different way. And you can see the, the greener and the bluer are the higher life expectancies. And as you go to the left towards the, the red and the yellow, you can see that those are lower life expectancies and those are very much clustered in certain parts of the world. And while those were graphs that really showed the entire world, we can also really bring this back into just looking at the United States as well. And so there's this interesting project that was done looking at life expectancy by zip code in the United States. And if you look at maps that really look at those different life expectancies, you can see that there are very wide differences in life expectancies in cities and zip codes and counties that are very close to each other. And so looking at this map in New Orleans, Louisiana, you can see that there's a 25 life year difference in a very, very short geographic distance. So if you live in one zip code, your life expectancy is 80 years old, which is also not that high when you compare it to a lot of other really developed countries. So take that as note as well. Um, but if you live in a different part of New Orleans, your life expectancy is only 55. We can see this in other states as well. Um, so this is Washington, DC. You can see that there's actually a 19 year difference between the zip codes that live the longest and the zip codes that live the shortest in Washington, DC. So these are pretty extreme examples. However, definitely more subtle ones exist as well. And these differences have a, they really play a big part on how people expect their lives to go. And so during residency, I actually had a patient who was, she was in her mid fifties, I think she was 56. And she's someone that has stayed with me for a long time. So she'd been diagnosed with metastatic, but still treatable breast cancer, but hadn't really followed up with anyone. And she came into the ED complaining of chest pain and difficulty breathing. And it turns out she had a pretty significant pleural effusion. She didn't want to come to the hospital to get it treated. And so I ended up sitting with her for a long time, just trying to understand why. Um, you know, when there was a good chance with aggressive therapy that she could live for quite a long time. And she said to me, look, I'm 56. I've lived a good life. If this is what's, and I, I've lived a long life, she said. And she said, if this is what's going to kill me, I'm okay with that. It's something that I've never really forgotten, and I still can't 100% wrap my mind around. I said, what has she seen in her community and her family that 56 could be considered old for her? And this was in the U.S., so she couldn't really have far, lived far from where I lived. She was going to the same hospital that I was lived pretty close to. And while that's an extreme example, it's also a good example of how stark the differences are that just exist even in the U.S., between a community's experience of health and what people think that they can expect out of their lives. And so much of that can really be traced to where you live. So this is a really interesting tool from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that I referenced earlier. And it shows how life expectancy varies by zip code in the US. And so you can put a zip code in um, and it will feed back to you what the life expectancy is in that zip code, how it compares to the zip code of the um, state as a whole and how it compares to the zip code of the country as a whole. So for example, I put in where my parents live and they live in Beaufort County, North Carolina, and it pops up as a life expectancy of 75, a little bit lower than the average of North Carolina and the U.S. in general. However, so my mom is 71. Um, do I expect her to life expectancy to be 75 looking at this? And the answer is of course no. Um, I expect her to live much longer than that. Um, but she moved to this zip code. 
by choice, and she was shielded from the other determinants of health that affect people in that zip code. Because again, fact two, place matters even more for the poor than it matters in general. And so I definitely, I encourage everyone to check out this tool. They have a lot of really interesting graphics um, as well, and it's, it's pretty enlightening. And so going back to the TED Talk again, um, let's look at fact number three. So healthcare is about access to food, exercise, education, healthcare, social support and exposure to trauma, violence, and racism. And what are those? Well, they don't actually say this in the TED Talk itself, but those are the social determinants of health. And it's really what we're here to talk about today. So we finally made it. So what is the official definition of a social determinant health? Um, this varies quite a bit. There's no standardized definition, but one what that I like is that the social determinants of health are the conditions and the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. And this is from the Health and Human Services and of the United States, and that's what really they use for the social determinants of health. So there's a lot there. Um, it's pretty broad and encompasses a lot of different things. And so to make it a little bit more manageable, they have also broken it down into five categories, which you can see there in the graphic. And so looking more specifically, some of the topics include safe housing, transportation, neighborhoods, talking about racism, discrimination and violence, education, job opportunities and income, access to nutritious foods and physical activity opportunities, polluted air and water and other environmental concerns, and then looking at language and literacy skills as well. So these are all part of the social environment in which somebody lives. And looking at them, it's pretty intuitive that we can see how and why all of these things can matter. But how much do they matter is really the next question. And so a lot of people, smart people have been trying to figure this out and been trying to quantify this. And so this is one of the graphics and one of the kind of the breakdowns that I've seen pretty commonly. And as healthcare workers who work in a hospital, some of this is a little uh, disconcerting because you can see there at the bottom that of people's health experience of health, their life expectancy, their health outcomes, only 20% of it seems to be based in healthcare. 30% is just personal health behaviors, 10% is the physical environment itself, and 40% is socioeconomic factors. And so while well, there's definitely some overlap there in what you would consider the social determinants health, you could definitely make the argument that people's health, to pay, health behaviors are very much influenced by their physical environment and by their socioeconomic factors. You can see that when taken together, almost between 50 and 80% of someone's health outcomes are really due to what you could say either social or individual determinants of health or lifestyle determinants of health, and really only 20% is healthcare. And so where does that leave us as emergency medicine people? I mean, we work in the hospital, we see patients in the hospital. And where does this leave us as people who are interested in global health or global emergency medicine? For that, I wanna take it back to Dr. Alsley's three opportunities. And so opportunity one, invest in public health. Well, this doesn't mean that all of us need to go out and get a master's degree in public health, though I'm sure some of you will. Um, it does mean that we should be thinking about how we engage with the public health sector and how we really work to blur the lines between really public health and clinical care. So you're going to get a lot more lectures and exposure to the different possibilities within the practice of global emergency medicine. So I'm not going into a lot of that here. But one of the incredible opportunities that we have as emergency medicine physicians is that we have a very wide skill set and that makes us really uniquely suited to working in different settings with different types of people. And because of this diversity, in our practice and really the patient populations that we see, we can often see and make connections that other people miss. By thinking on both an individual and population level, we can design a lot of really interesting programs and interventions. So opportunity two, think and work upstream. So what are the causes of the causes? And so I love what he says in his talk when he talks about the pathophysiology in the social realm, not just the physical realm, which we always talk about. And this is another really opportunity, I think, that is really uniquely suited to emergency medicine. We're always thinking about how to prevent the next visit, the next hospitalization. Every time we discharge a patient, we're wondering, well, why this patient came in today and how can we prevent them from coming back? And while we do work pretty far downstream, our perspective downstream really gives us a 
really good view of what's going wrong upstream about why people are coming to the emergency department, but why are coming to see us, what systems have failed them and how they've been affected by this environment. And so because of that perspective, that really in so ways makes our job so difficult and exhausting, it also gives us expertise to really develop programs and to implement policies that can really look upstream. And I think that this is true both in the US domestically and globally. It's by seeing the causes of the causes and in seeing them and talking about them, we have the opportunity to make a lot of changes. And then opportunity three, tackle feedback cycles. Well, Dr. Said was really speaking about this in terms of poverty and poor health. There are a lot of other feedback cycles that we can see and attempt to intervene on, and we do this already. So we do this not only when we refer to primary care, but we also try and get a care manager to directly schedule an appointment. We do this every time we ask if somebody has heat or air conditioning in their home or if they can, and if they can afford to run it. We do it when we ask people that can afford their medications. And so we're really looking for those determinants of health and how we might intervene on them. And it's important that while we might not have all the answers just by asking the questions that we are really in a unique position to ask, we can start developing solutions to those problems. And I do want to acknowledge that this is exhausting. Uh, we don't, we can't do this on every patient. We can't do this every day. We just, we simply don't have enough support for that. Um, but by looking to tackle those feedback cycles, we can better see where interventions could be effective in improving really the health of our patients and maybe even some easing some of the strain on our departments as well. So these three opportunities, I think, are really, they're all ways of really thinking about what makes people sick, what makes people healthy, and what we can do about it. So while that was all a lot, there's one more thing that I do want to leave you with before we close here. And that's the framework from the WHO known as Health and All Policies. And so it's a framework for addressing the social determinants of health. And so this framework really emphasizes the impact that all sectors have on a person's health. And that to truly ensure that all people have equal opportunity to achieve the highest level of health, that all policies, regardless of what they address on the surface, should be considered from their impact on the health of people. And so here they use the example of how one in eight deaths worldwide are related to air pollution. However, the reasons why air pollution is bad or why a specific person or community is exposed to high levels of air pollution is driven by many factors, the majority of which are not directly situated in the traditional health field. And so these factors touch sectors as diverse as transportation and waste management to industry and urban planning. And traditionally health has not really been at the top of the agenda or even on the agenda at all for these different sectors. So they have different mandates or the economics have driven them in different directions. However, without changes in each of these sectors, air pollution deaths will not go down. And so this is where the health in all policies and the voices of health professionals become so key. So the core piece of this is that the health sector drives conversations within all sectors to keep good health at the tops of everyone's minds. And so as health professionals, I, just, I wanna kind of leave with this is that we can see the connections that other sectors may miss. So we can see what happens when there's a lot of pollution in a particular neighborhood or a price of insulin spikes, or even like really when a fire breaks out and a lot of people die, and it's because they all end up in the emergency department. There are the patients that we see. And so by using our perspectives and our voices to advocate to other specters, we can really help address the social determinants of health and improve the outcomes for our patients or even prevent patient, people from becoming our patients in the first place.